The Jews are wicked. The Jews pretend to be good, but really, says Paul, you know better than anybody else. So Romans 1, the Gentiles are wicked. Romans 2, the Jews are wicked. So he gets to this point and he says, well, look, I think I've proved that whether a Jew or a Gentile, whatever your genetic origin, we are all under sin. Verse 10, he quotes the Old Testament. There is none righteous, no, not one. All right, so that's, that's where we're at. So we can't sit here saying, oh, oh, you know, I think I'm okay. I cooked some biscuits for the lady across the road. Well, that was a nice thing to do, but you're still a sinner, right? We're still sinners. However nice we are, what about that evil thought you thought this morning and you thought, comes I don't like the person next door or whatever it was? You know, we all sin in word, in thought, in action, right? So we're all under sin. So we're in a mess. So how are we going to get out of this mess? So your pen's gone to sleep. When we get to verse 19 and 20, he says, well, actually, God gave all these commandments and no one can actually keep them, right? The law speaks to everyone under the law that every mouth may be stopped and all the world guilty. So what does all of God's laws and commandments do? They just prove that we're sinners. Right? And if we're not sure whether we disobey, we'll just read God's commandments. What was the tenth commandment on the tables of stone that God gave to Moses at Mount Sinai? What was the tenth commandment? If you think you've done all, you've never murdered anybody, I've never committed adultery, I've never done all these things, well, you get to the tenth one, and what does that say? You shall not covet. Right? And can you honestly say, I did not disobey the tenth commandment today? You know, I didn't covet Aaron's lollies at all. <laughs> we all covet, right? Whether you can say... I didn't rob anybody today, or I didn't murder anyone today. And then Jesus laid on and came along and said, well, you know, if you're really angry with somebody for no reason, you know, when you waved your fist at the car driver on the right-hand side, of you, well, I was a cyclist today, so yeah, I get annoyed with car drivers a lot, because they always try to kill me. But, <laughs> you know, if you're angry with them, Jesus said, well, that's as bad as murder. You know, let's not pretend, play games here. We've all sinned, all right? We're all guilty before God. And God's law can't make us right, verse 20, by deeds, works of law, we're not going to be right before God. All God's law tells us is that we're all sinners because we can't keep it. Okay, then in verse 21, now God's righteousness is seen. He doesn't, he's against sin, but he doesn't lower his standards. He displays his righteousness by the faith of Jesus Christ. It's a new way. It was anticipated in the Old Testament. It's a new way of being right with God by faith in Jesus Christ. Okay. So it's all based around, verse 22, faith in Jesus Christ. So Jesus said to his disciples, look, you have an advantage. You've all seen me. But happy are those people that never saw me and yet believe in me. And that's where we are tonight. We believe in Jesus Christ. So he comes to this great statement in verse 23. Just make it all clear where we all sit. There's no argument. We've all sinned 
had come short of the glory of God. You know, even if you didn't think you did anything really bad today, did you actually do something really good, really pleasing to God? And that's the only test, isn't it? Did it please God or didn't it please God? And he says, well, we've all sinned. We all fell short of God's glory. But in verse 24, God is going to give us a gift. He is going to justify us. What's another word for justify? What is, what is uh, make right? Oh, dear. Should have got here clearly early and got a rubber. Okay. We are justified or made right. And how are we made right before God? Thank you very much. How we were astray from God, we're on the wrong side of God. How does he make us right? Covering us with Christ. Let's be really simple through forgiving our sins. How does he make us right? He says, Bruce, you're a terrible sinner. You've done all these things against me, but I'm going to wash away your sins. You are a righteous person in my sight. Okay? And he does this freely. Freely. He doesn't say, Look, I really don't. You, you, you know, if Daniel punches me in the nose and he says, Oh, sorry about that. I said, Oh, yeah, okay. That's not free, is it? God's generous. He says, Ah, I've forgiven you your sin. Yeah, you know, the, there's a word in the, in, for forgiveness in the New Testament. I owe Daniel. $100,000. <laughs> Better than a patch of the nose, isn't it? Now, there's two words in the Greek language for forgiveness. One is to put an X through it. Daniel's cancelled my debt. Yeah? But what's the problem with Daniel cancelling my debt? It's not forgotten, yeah? D Daniel still remembers that I owed him $100,000. Think, crumbs, that was terrible. But the other New Testament word which God uses is to wipe the slate clean. You remember they used to write things on slates and they'd write the slate clean. Now where's the debt? doesn't exist. And that's the word God uses for his forgiveness. He doesn't just cancel our sins as if, you know, oh, well, you know, I have to forgive Bruce because he prayed for forgiveness. No, God wipes the slate clean as if the sin never happened. That's the extent of God's generosity. So I hope Daniel will wipe the slate clean. Good. That's freely making things right. You know, we've made it right. There's no debt between us at all. By his grace, his favour, his goodness, through redemption in Christ Jesus. So, what Christ was doing hanging on the cross was to bring about a state where my sins and your sins could be forgiven. Now, Verse 25 said, God can redeem us. That's the word used in verse 24, redemption. And the word in verse 25 is remission. God can redeem us, rescue us from sin. 
because of what Jesus has done. He can remit our sins. He can pass over our sins. So, what do we need to do? Well, in verse 25, or back in verse um, yeah, 25, God set him forth through faith in his blood. Right? So, what do we do? What's the active word? Of, what is faith? Belief. Belief in... Belief in something we cannot see, but we have reasonable grounds to believe it. All right? Exactly. And that's, Jesus uses that very analogy in John 3. So what do we have to do? What, what's our part in all this? Jesus hung in agony on the cross. What's, what are we asked to do? Verse 25 we are asked to have faith. We are asked to believe. To believe. You say, well, so all we have to do is believe. We have to believe so much that it changes the way we live as men and women and children. We have to believe without any doubt that God worked through his son. Now, we have to have faith in Christ's blood. Does that sound a bit bizarre? Faith in blood? Why? What, what do we believe about Christ's blood? First of all, why blood? His life. So, as the next... <coughs> well, I have to go on with you. I thought it was on the next thing. Come on. Ah, blood is a symbol of life because it takes oxygen and nutrients around our body. So, dear friend Julie is in Stirling Hospital. She has very little breath and so her brain's being starved of oxygen and she starts to say some unusual things, right? Because there's not enough oxygen. It is the blood that takes our oxygen around the body and all the other nutrients. So it is a symbol of life. Okay? So we believe in his life. What do we believe about his life? So if his blood represents his life, where did that beautiful wiping the slate clean go? So his blood equals his life. What do we believe about Jesus' life? Absolutely, right? So that's the core of it. He lives a sin-free life. What would you say he had done with sin by the end of his life? Destroyed it. He was tempted, but he destroyed, defeated sin. So we believe that Jesus achieved what none of us could do. He lived the sinless life. He conquered, defeated, destroyed sin in himself because on not one day did he ever allow sin to rise in his mind? Sin never influenced his words, his actions, or his thoughts. He might have had a thought of sin, but he immediately destroyed it. So we believe in his life. Now the other word here is propitiation. Propitiation is about winning someone's favour appeasing, conciliating, and that might be a bit complex for the children. So let's come back here. 
So, the fundamental point is God is right about everything. His law is right, his acts are right. We break God's law, we're sinners. God wants us to be put right, but he can't do that by making himself wrong. So he gave his son to die on our behalf. If we recognise the rightness of God, we accept Jesus' death, we believe in it, we can be forgiven. That's the most critical thing. So Jesus taught us to love God with all our heart and to love our neighbour as ourselves. And Jesus did it all the time. Never failed. But we fail. We fail to love God. We fail to love our neighbour. So we break God's law. But God always loves us. But we must remember, God will not love us if we are wicked and disobey him. Habakkuk 1, God is of purer eyes than to behold evil. He cannot look on wickedness. So the centre of God's existence is love. John says God is love. And yet we break the love of God, we break the love of of people around us. So, if you want to see a contrast between God's love and human hate, you look at Jesus on the cross. There were the religious leaders, the priests, the Pharisees, wanting to, with absolute hatred of Jesus. And Jesus, all he did was extended himself in love to them. And offered his blood, he offered his life. Now, this was God's plan. This was always God's plan. Acts 2, Peter says it was the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God. It was always in God's plan. So sin had come into the world. It needed to be defeated. And Jesus Christ won the victory. He defeats sin. So, we've talked about propitiation. And other translations say... God appointed him as a sacrifice for reconciliation. This word propitiation is slightly difficult to translate. God put forward a sacrifice of atonement, a place of atonement. And it goes back to olden days under God's law when they had an ark with cherubim, angel figures on the end, and in the middle was what was called the mercy seat where the blood was poured. And the writer of Romans, the Apostle Paul, is thinking about a place where God makes forgiveness. So God, verse 25, set forth. He put forward. He offered. He appointed. His son. God said, here's my son. He's going to be the way of forgiveness. But just as God gave his son, Jesus responded and voluntarily laid down his life, gave his life. And we think of the offering of Abraham, of his son Isaac. Abraham gave his son Isaac, but Isaac went with his father. Okay, so this idea of propitiation, a place of atonement, the lid of the ark of God's mercy seat, and that's where they poured out the blood and we are brought near in this place of forgiveness through Jesus Christ. Okay, now, let's move on from Romans 3 to Romans 4. And in Romans 4, he talks about Abraham. And he talks about Abraham, who was an old man who had no children. How old was he when, he, when God first dealt with him? Any guesses? 70, 75? 75? Do you know any man aged 75? 
My God, that's a bit cruel. You're supposed to love your neighbour. I've just heard 60 there. There we are. Yeah, good. Franklin's about heading up there. Now, he's told at 75 that he's never had a child, but he's going to become a father. Right? And how old's his wife? She's 10 years younger, so she's 65. Right? And if you know a woman of 65 who's never had a baby, she's not expecting it's going to happen. It's over, right? And yet God says, you are going to have a son and he is going to have a son. He's going to be the father of a great multitude. So we won't talk about the whole life of Abraham, but he got to 99 with no son and God said, you're going to have a son next year. Oh, he did have a son, but not Sarah never have a child. He got to 99, she got to 89. God said, you're going to have a baby Sarah next year. And she laughed. She said, that's ridiculous, God. You're kidding. I'm not going to have a baby. I'm 89. Who are you kidding? And God said to Sarah, you know, Sarah, is there anything too hard for God? Anything. He left it at that. Is anything too hard for God? Because if anything was too hard for God, how could he save us? And God guarantees that if we die, he's going to do the impossible thing and bring us out of the grave. Right? But in Romans 4, Paul talks about Abraham and, and he was thinking about his dead body. You know, dead in the sense he couldn't have children and Sarah, end of verse 19, her womb was dead. She wasn't going to have a baby. But in verse 20, he staggered not at the promise of God. So God wants us to have a belief in him that he will achieve a human impossibility with our dead bodies. So we go down to Centennial Park and we put somebody's body in the ground. And God says, I want you to believe that that grave is going to open up one day and that person's going to be alive again. Can you believe that? Well, Abraham believed that his body, which was dead for all purposes of being a father, and Sarah's body was dead, he staggered not. Verse 20, he was strong in faith. He said, God, if you say you can do this, I believe you. Okay? And God was impressed with his faith. And he said to Abram, Abraham, he's then called, you are a righteous man. He, was he righteous? No, he had lots of sins like you and me. But God says, look, Abraham, I've wiped the slate clean. You are a sinless man before me because you believe in the human impossibility. The dead body can be raised. Verse 24, what about us? How do we feature? What dead body do we have to believe that was raised? Verse 24, to us also, for we can be counted right if we believe on God that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead. So here's the challenge. So we believe in the human impossibility. Abraham did. He believed his dead body, Sarah's dead body, could be made alive. They could have a baby. Do we believe the dead body, that there was a tomb in the garden with a stone, huge stone rolled against it, and Jesus' body was in there, and angels removed the stone. You know what they did with the stone? 
in the Gospels, it says they actually picked up the stone and plopped it over there. Right? They just didn't roll it. They actually physically, the angels picked it up and threw it over there and said, that's easy for angels, you know. Rolling a, tossing a one-ton stone is just, you know, normal because we've got the power of the universe on our side. And they opened the grave and they got the body of Jesus out of there and they made him alive. And Paul says, can you believe that? Because if you can believe that, you can have your sins forgiven too. Right? You have to believe in the human impossibility. You've been wicked, Daniel. I'll write another list of our debts afterwards. So in verse 25, Jesus was delivered for our sins, our offences, what we had done wrong. But he's made alive for our justification, our making right. We are made right because Jesus is alive. And because we are made right, our sins are forgiven, chapter 5, verse 1, we have peace with God. How do we have peace? What does peace mean here? Seems to be lots of wars, lots of arguments. What's peace? No debt. We have peace with God. What does peace mean in the Bible sense of peace? It doesn't mean no war. Peace means in harmony. That's exactly what it means. The, the, bio, the Greek word peace, irony, means unity more than not fighting. It means harmony. It means oneness. Right? We have this wonderful harmony with God because we believe that God did the impossible thing. He raised Jesus from the dead. And, and because of our belief in verse 2, we have, by this belief, we, we through grace, through God's favour, we stand and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. So are we rejoicing about our present condition? You know, when your friends are dying, you've got this physical frame that's dreadful, we've got this tendency to sin, but we rejoice in hope. Okay? Looking forward. In the glory of God. Okay. Now, it goes on to explain how this all occurred. Verse 6. Tanya, would you like to read that verse for us? For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. Okay, let's get this without strength. What does this mean? Before we were born? Yeah, well, yes, it was before we were born. We had no strength. Put this in simple terms. We had a faith. We had faith, but what couldn't we do? We couldn't. We couldn't be sinless. We couldn't fix our problem. We were in sin, right? We were without strength. We did not have the capacity to solve our problem. Our absolute problem is that we're all dying. Yeah? When you're little, you probably don't understand death, but, you know, the older you get, the more you come to realise we're all dying. And we're dying because we're sinners. We were without strength. We, we didn't have any capacity to fix our problem. How could we declare ourselves sinless? We couldn't do it. In due time, so there was a time in God's mind when this would all happen, about 2,000 years ago. In due time, Christ died for the ungodly. That's us. The ungodly. We're all the ungodly. Christ died for us. That's our theme verse, 1 Timothy 1.15. Christ came into the world to save sinners. So it goes on to say in verse 7, well, if you saw a really good person, let's call this person a righteous person, yeah, a really sort of pretty good person, 
and they're walking across Goodwood Road and they don't see an electric car coming. It's going to kill them, right? And you think, look, you know, I really like Josh. He's a really good man, right? And I rush out and I grab him just before the Tesla comes. I was nearly run over by a Tesla in, in Beijing this year, so, you know, no, I'm a bit scared about Teslas. So I rush out and save him because I have high regard for him. Yeah? So an, an exemplary person, you might try and help. What about a good man? You know, not, not a righteous man, but a person's pretty good. Like Daniel, you know. A Samaritan. <laughs> a Samaritan, exactly. Yeah. Well, a good man, you might dare to die. You might be willing to do some act. But, but when Christ came to save us, we weren't righteous men or good men. We were, in verse 8, sinners. God's love for us is that we were hideous individuals in sin. But Christ died for us. Right? You think, why would Christ want to die for us when we're ungodly, sinners? Then in verse 9, being now made right, what's the other word, what's the other idea here? Justified, made right, sins forgiven by his blood. How are our sins forgiven by Jesus' blood? How does that happen? How are my sins forgiven because Jesus shed his blood? Just sort of reminding, let's remind ourselves of the point that Paul's making in Romans here. Through baptism, we'll come to that in chapter 6. I believe that Jesus Christ destroyed sin. Yeah? I can't do it, but I'm happy to share his victory over sin. Right? I failed, he succeeded. But he says, you become part of me and you can share my defeat of sin. I say, that's wonderful. You know, I can't do it. I'm a dreadful sinner. But he did it. And he wants me to share his achievement. Right? I'm happy with that. We are justified, made right by his blood. We are saved from wrath through him. Well, we're all deserving death. We're all dying creatures. I look at friend Julie and think she's 66. She's not an old woman. You know, she was a very vigorous, active person. But we're all owed only death, aren't we? Verse 10. We were enemies. Who were we enemies of and why were we enemies? Right, verse 10. We were enemies of God. What makes us enemies of God? Sin, right? It's sin that separates us from God. Right? You can prove that many times in the Bible. It's sin that creates a barrier between us and God. But w Absolutely. We were enemies. Now we're at peace because the enmity has been removed. Absolutely. If, when we were enemies, we were reconciled made one with God. This is the harmony, the unity that Matt was speaking about. We are reconciled by the death of his son. So we were out there and God says, you can come in and be close to me and I'll be your father. All I want you to do is believe that Jesus died to defeat sin. You can share what he accomplished. Okay. Okay. So now, being reconciled, we are saved by his life. What does that mean, we are saved by his life? He's resurrected. He's now alive. Where is he now? 
He's on the right hand of God. What's he doing on the right hand of God? Mediating. The book of Hebrews says simply, he is on the right hand of God for us. You want to know what he's doing up there? He's there for us. So what does he do for us? So right now, Jesus Christ is in heaven at God's right hand for us. What does he do for us? Right, so he is our means of approaching the Father, yes. What else does he do for us? Mediates. Pleads our cause. There's another expression Paul uses in Hebrews too. He says, he runs to our cry. So Paul says he's like a servant in heaven. And when we cry out, he runs to help. Right? He is aware of the circumstances we are going through and he is there in heaven to help us that we might be in his kingdom. Is that pretty astounding? Yeah? That's what he's there for. He says, all you have to do is ask, and I'll run. I'll run to your cry. Right? Just as priests in old times used to help the people, Christ is in heaven ready to help us. Okay. So, we are saved because he's a resurrected man. He's alive and we could live in him. Okay. And then in verse 12, he says, By one man, sin came into the world. Who is the one man? We all know his name. Adam. Adam. Sin entered the world and death by sin. So there's our problem. Sin came into the world and because of sin, death. And so death passed upon all men. Anyone that's going to escape death? No. We're all going to receive death. Because we have all sinned. Okay? Verse 21. Sin reigns like a king to bring death. But God's grace, his favour, his love reigns through his righteousness to life. That's what it's all about. God wants to give us eternal life in his kingdom. Now, in chapter 6, he explains how this is all going to happen. Verse 4. Okay. So what's that tell us, Daniel? Chapter 6, verse 4. Okay, so there was Jesus in the grave, the stone rolled across it, the stone was rolled away, Jesus comes forth, the dead is now made alive. And we go through the same process. And we go through it through what's called baptism. And we find some water. And we go down into the water. And we go under the water. And we stop breathing. And we are dead. And then we come out. And we are alive. Yeah. And, and now we're alive. We live, says Paul, a new life, just as Jesus does. So, 
we talked before about Jesus succeeded, we failed. But through baptism, we share what Jesus accomplished. We die with him underwater. We rise again to a new life. Okay, and so then in Romans 6, Paul goes on to tell us about the great change in our life because he it says it's like changing masters. We used to worship or serve a master king called, in verse 12, who's the king in verse 12? Sin. Okay, but we stopped serving sin and verse 17, ye were the servants of sin, but now in verse 18, you're no longer serving sin, you're serving righteousness. Well, is it good fun serving sin? Sometimes, you're absolutely right. In the short run, Serving sin seems good, yeah? But here he tells us that the result of serving sin in verse 23 is death, yeah? But serving righteousness, well, first of all, he says you've got freedom now to obey God, verse 20, and God will give you eternal life. Okay, so the death and resurrection of Christ is absolutely central to the gospel because through what he achieved, we can have eternal life in his kingdom. So because I'm feeling sad, I want to finish with 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And I'd like to read verse 13 to 18. If someone likes to read it in a loud voice. Mate, you've been volunteered. <laughs> Key word, if we believe, right? It's all around belief. We need that faith that Jesus died and rose again. This is the core of what enables us to face the future. It's faith, belief. Jesus dead and rose again. Keep going. What does the word prevent mean there? To go before. Yep. So, so yeah, he's just talking about people who are alive and people are dead when Jesus comes. Yep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in God shall rise first. Now this is the impossible thing. God wants us to believe that the dead will rise, that those who are dead in Jesus Christ will rise again. They'll live again upon the earth. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, come to one another in this place. So the end of it all. It's because Jesus hung on the cross and suffered for our sins. We can ever be with him. We can ever be with him. This is the comfort, says the Apostle Paul. 
Okay, the ideas tonight might have been a little complex, but we can have a night next year. We could unpack them a bit more and just mull over what the crucifixion was about.